Thank you. Thank you for coming. Uh, I'm not used to my voice being amplified. Uh, I do speak in large auditoriums, but uh, usually I don't need the mic, so let's consider that a, a warning, I guess. Um, I see some of you have brought your, your barbecue uh, to the talk. I kind of admire that. Uh, so, um, All right, well, thank you for coming. Um, and before I start, uh, I want to stipulate I will not be talking about uh, the virtues or the drawbacks of white sauce on chicken. Uh, I will not be making any declarations about where in the state you can eat the best ribs or pulled pork shoulder. Um, those, as I'm sure many of you know, those are the kind of arguments nobody ever wins, um, and that usually end up with somebody getting hurt. Uh, but what I will be talking about is the history of Alabama barbecue, uh, which is something that seems like such a given uh, in the culture of the region and the state that it's rarely really thought of, of having a history at all. But it does, of course, like anything else. And that history tracks alongside Alabama's evolution, uh, and particularly alongside its politics and the complexities of race in the state. So Alabama began as a frontier society deeply rooted in white male democracy and racial slavery. It struggled then to retain public places, became unacceptable and illegal. And at every step of the way, along Alabama's journey from a profoundly divided place to a more inclusive one, barbecue helped establish the boundaries that set people apart and the terms under which they might come together. Now, as a cuisine and as a method of cooking, barbecue predates the state of Alabama. Uh, most scholars trace the origin of barbecue really to the earliest years of contact between Native Americans and Europeans in North America. Uh, Europeans who customarily roasted meat in Europe, sometimes boiled it, um, they observed the Native American practice of slow cooking meat, there it goes, that actually works, uh, by, uh, by slow cooking meat by smoking it over coals. Now, Native Americans had no pre-existing familiarity with hogs or pigs, which came to British North America, along with the original settlers of the Jamestown colony. But the smoking technique was readily adaptable, and by the end of the colonial period, Barbecuing a whole hog had become a common way in Virginia, the Carolinas, and Georgia to feed a crowd at a community or a family gathering. And it was also especially popular at political events. Candidates for office might host a barbecue to demonstrate their generosity to their constituents, sometimes as a way to attract voters. Now, as white settlers migrated toward the Deep South and toward the Gulf Coast in the early 19th century, they brought their foodways with them, which meant that one would have seen barbecue in Alabama even before it officially achieved statehood in 1819. And these were not only white foodways, of course, because one would have likely seen enslaved African Americans doing the preparation and the cooking at most barbecues. Um, that had been true even in the colonial period. Now, at a typical barbecue in early Alabama, uh, a white man often supervised the barbecue pits, but the true pit masters were usually enslaved people who applied their own techniques, their own recipes. Uh, by the 19th century, those techniques and recipes were themselves the products of numerous generations of preparing food for white people. In fact, because they often attended barbecues and bore responsibility for making them happen, Barbecues were one of the relatively few occasions during which black Alabamians might feel a sense of power and a sense of freedom in an environment that only allowed them to experience those things on rare occasions. So barbecues in early Alabama are these kind of events where whites and blacks came together, but their central purpose was as an excuse to gather large groups of people from across a pretty scattered rural landscape. And particularly, they were about bringing white men together to celebrate the democratic political sphere of the age of Jackson. Now, barbecue at this stage of the state's history, um, you like that? Yeah, Andrew Jackson getting, uh, I would say roasted, but he's actually getting smoked. Um, and I, I would try to decipher uh, each of the ins and outs of those captions, but I don't know the answer to all of them, and most of them would bore you with uh, Tales of Amos Kendall and other obscure 19th century politicians. Um, but you get the point. Um, barbecue at this stage of the state's history, very early on, it need not necessarily be pork. Uh, hosts would prepare really whatever animals that nearby farmers had available. Pigs, cows, sheep, poultry. 
but whatever was on offer, barbecue uh, was a central component of the state's democratic politics. A Huntsville observer noted in 1827 in the newspapers, for example, it is only necessary for any of nature's noblemen who can buy, beg, or borrow a shoat and a keg of whiskey to cry barbecue, barbecue, and the candidates are all obliged to post off and attend it. What candidate, he continued, can be elected unless he goes to the barbecue? But this association of politics and barbecue was controversial. Uh, some critics correctly observed that barbecues were occasions where people gathered, sure, for fellowship and food, uh, but they were also places where men gathered to drink, to excess, great excess. Uh, members of the more conservative Whig party in particular, they often expressed their desire that women attend the barbecues alongside their husbands in the hope that their presence would dissuade men from drinking. And women did often attend. Uh, that didn't stop drinking, um, and it didn't stop the violence that often came along with it. Um, critics lamented that political barbecues became sites of drunkenness, people shouting long into the night, uh, and fighting that sometimes became deadly, uh, such as in 1843 when a man stabbed somebody at a barbecue in Coosa County, and he was then killed by the posse that set out to arrest him after he opened fire into the group and tried fighting with the members of the posse. Yeah, that was a barbecue that didn't end well. But more broadly, critics complained that barbecues were unseemly venues for politics. They believed that the association of electioneering with gluttony and drunkenness marked a descent into mob rule. It signified a kind of religious immorality that should not be associated with the politics that they argued called for a serious and considered focus on issues. These critics basically were complaining that they thought politicians ought to be persuading voters through their ideas rather than by entertaining them with a barbecue and getting them drunk. In Madison County in the 1820s, local reformers even tried eliminating political barbecues altogether. This was a bit of a fool's errand. Uh, give you just sort of one example of how this played out, and it only played out for a few years, it did not go well. Uh, in the county race for tax collector in 1828, there was at least one candidate who made a point of refusing to attend barbecues during political season. Uh, there were nine men running for uh, tax collector that, that year. He finished seventh. <laughs> so by the middle of the 19th century, barbecues had become events that could bring people together, uh, albeit on unequal terms that reflected the broader society. And they'd become integral components of the state's political culture. And so accordingly, it was no surprise that as the Civil War came, leading Alabama secessionists, men like William, La uh, William Lowndes Yancey, would make their case to white Alabamians to leave the Union at barbecues, um, as Yancey did on a number of occasions in the summer of 1860. Now, in some ways, the culture of barbecue in the state didn't change a whole lot as a consequence of the Civil War that politicians like Yancey helped bring about. Alabamians after the war, for example, continued to use barbecues to celebrate national holidays like the 4th of July. They continued to serve a variety of different kinds of meat at these events. And politicians continued to use barbecues as venues for appealing to large numbers of voters. Uh, in the summer of 1899, for example, Judge Jesse Stallings and State Senator Russell Cunningham, both of whom were running for governor, took advantage of an enormous public barbecue in Cortland to make their respective cases to an audience reported to be more than 3,000 strong. That's a lot of people to get in one place in Alabama in 1899. But the Civil War did, of course, bring enormous change to Alabama as well. And the most momentous of those changes were the defeat of the disunionism that Yancey had advocated and, of course, the emancipation and enfranchisement of the state's black population. And there were moments after the war when white Alabamians tried appealing to black voters. Even as whites overwhelmingly voted Democratic and blacks overwhelmingly voted Republican, and they tried making those appeals with the barbecue that always seemed to be good for a few votes. After the 1876 presidential election, for example, Democratic leaders in Alabama rewarded dozens of African-Americans who had voted Democratic that year 
by hosting an impromptu barbecue in their honor. But by and large, black voters would not be bought with smoked pork. And the Democratic Party in Alabama in the late 19th century didn't have a whole lot of success winning black votes with barbecue or really with anything else. The Republicans were the party of Lincoln and the party of emancipation, and a free meal was not going to change those loyalties. And white, Alabama, white, uh, white Democrats in Alabama knew it, which meant that by and large they preferred to keep black people from voting altogether. And so at the barbecues of the post-war period, black Alabamians were much more likely to face harassment and abuse than they were to be treated as guests. And that started right away. In late 1865, for example, a white con artist worked a black audience gathered at a barbecue, scammed roughly 300 people by selling them sets of little pegs for a dollar a piece with which the buyers could supposedly demarcate the 40 acres of land they hoped to receive from the government. Two years later, in 1867, the Ku Klux Klan in Alabama invited black guests to a barbecue that African Americans were understandably hesitant to attend. Uh, they heard rumors that the Klan intended to poison them at this event. Now the host reassured them that everything would be okay, and so some black Alabamians actually showed up for this thing, only to hear speakers lambaste Willard Warner, who was a white Republican candidate for the U.S. Senate, and the speakers complained that Warner was running the Negro machine and electioneering with the Negroes. So by the end of the century, black Alabamians who were still willing to attend an integrated barbecue as guests, they knew it was pretty likely that white people there might ridicule them, disparage them, or simply resort to violence against them. The political campaign scene opened with a barbecue in Eufaula in 1890, for example. Hosts hoped that it would be, quote, memorable in the history of Caucasian and democratic supremacy. Now, you might wonder why would any black person go to an event like that, uh, but one who did found himself accused of cutting in line for food, whereupon four police officers and numerous white citizens set upon him, beat him with clubs, and knocked him senseless as they dragged him off to jail. So, rather than being integrated, more typical of Alabama's barbecue scene in the post-emancipation era was the segregated environment that increasingly came to define social and political life throughout the state and throughout the region. And within that segregated environment, black Alabamians, who increasingly found themselves shut out from any formal political power, they started using barbecue in part as a way of carving out some kind of better future. And often that meant hosting public barbecues as fundraising efforts. Support mutual aid societies, schools, other institutions that black Alabamians began building. They're trying to find navigable, navigable paths within the constraints of Jim Crow. So George Newstall of Montgomery, for example, worked with Booker T. Washington at Tuskegee to create the Negro Business League of Montgomery. And in 1915, he recalled that the organization raised money and expanded in its early days, uh, more than 10 years earlier, at a barbecue. And he remembered, he said, we took it upon ourselves to give a barbecue with the twofold object of increasing our funds and at the same time making an effort to increase our membership. During the day of the barbecue, we not only netted a nice little sum of money, but we also secured quite an addition to the membership of the league. Now, white Alabamians in the age of Jim Crow, of course, had their own hopes for the future. And those hopes were often entangled with an imaginary and nostalgic vision of the recent past in which the cause of the Confederacy was the right one and it was one that could show white Southerners the way forward. And so accordingly, the political barbecues of the post-Civil War period sometimes served as occasions where white political candidates and white citizens could mix up partisan politics with expressions of bitterness about loss for the war, uh, reverence for the Confederacy, and some ideas about post-war Southern nationalism. Already by the early years of Reconstruction in the late 1860s, one might see former Confederate General Nathan Bedford Forrest and other former leaders of the Confederacy at barbecues in support of the Alabama Democratic Party. 
By the 1880s, the Confederacy had been gone for more than a decade. Uh, its leaders, mostly either dead or quite old. But that didn't stop a speaker at a barbecue jointly hosted by the Democratic Party and the Greenback Labor Party from proclaiming that the past could still actually be the future. He argued the Confederacy still exists, my friends. And he insisted that members of the crowd ought to continue to recognize Jefferson Davis as their president and that they definitely ought to vote Democratic if they wanted the white South to triumph in America. You must Democratic Party, he said, for a solid South will now give us entire control of the general government and we can redress all of our wrongs. Now, of course, the most notable and extensive public celebrations of the Confederacy in the decades after the Civil War were those of uh, veterans groups, organizations that continued to revere what came to be known as the lost cause. And they, too, used barbecue to advance a kind of nostalgic vision of the supposedly glorious and righteous antebellum and Confederate past. And I'll just give you two examples from around the turn of the century that speak to the role that barbecue could sometimes play in advancing the lost cause and weaving it into the public life of the South. Again, taking this from Eufaula, a woman named Stella Geis, who served as president of the Barber County chapter of the United Daughters of the Confederacy. She helped raise more than $3,000 toward the construction and erection of a Confederate monument. I'm not sure if it's the one that's still in Eufaula. I didn't actually determine if that's where it was, but you, if you've been to Ufala, you know that one statue on the, on the plinth there that you see in a lot of towns. Well, she raised more than $3,000 to build one of these by hosting a series of barbecues at her family's plantation on the Chattahoochee River. A few years before that, meanwhile, more than 2,000 people gathered in Opelika for what the newspaper called a gigantic reunion of Confederate veterans where they listened to local civic leaders while enjoying a free barbecue meal. And it probably looked something like this, although this, I, I could not, uh, images of this can be a little tricky to find the further back you go. This is not actually a barbecue, uh, and it is not actually in Alabama, but it gives you a sense of what these, uh, what these events might have looked like. Now, the Lost Cause, obviously, was not only about celebrating Southern distinctiveness. It wasn't only about white Southerners celebrating their dedication to the Confederate past. The Lost Cause was also about them figuring out how to reforge connections back to the rest of the country, how to reconcile with their former enemies. And here, too, barbecue might play a role. It might serve as a venue for articulating how that reconnection and that reunion might look. So in 1879, on the 4th of July, 5,000 former Confederates gathered in Montgomery for a celebration of the past and for what an Atlanta newspaper called an old-fashioned barbecue. The crowd heard a minister pay tribute to the wisdom and patriots of the men of 1776, but they also heard him emphasize that white Southerners should forever cherish the principles for which their forefathers contended. And when that minister was finished, you had a series of Southern speakers followed, but in a way you also had a series of Northern speakers follow because former Union generals Winfield Scott Hancock and George McClellan had written letters for this occasion, and those letters were read aloud to the audience. So it really wasn't until the 20th century that you had the first significant change in how Alabamians typically came to experience barbecue. The barbecue scene began to shift away from this. This is from the 20th century, but the barbecue scene stopped looking like this. Uh, it started to shift away from these big public picnics, local celebrations, and it turned more toward roadside stands, restaurant tables. And this change in foodways owed itself in turn to some broader changes that were shaping the state, the region, and the entire country. Now, barbecues, as I've said, have long been, were long elemental to bringing people together for special occasions and political gatherings from across what could be pretty sparsely populated rural areas. But by about the second or third decade of the 20th century, the landscape had become more urbanized, the automobile had, begun, had be, begun to penetrate American culture, improved roadways began allowing tourists and travelers to move across longer distances with greater ease, 
And as a consequence of those changes, city workers and visitors alike were generating enough demand to sustain daily restaurant operations. Factory and other urban workers needed some place to eat lunch. Travelers needed some place to eat during their journeys. And purveyors of barbecue in Alabama began to provide those needs. This is also the era when sub-regional variations on barbecue in the South became increasingly solidified. It's not until the restaurant era when barbecued lamb shoulder in western Kentucky, chicken-based Brunswick stew in Virginia, beef brisket in Texas. These things came not only to be the smoked delicacies of choice in those areas, they became emblematic of those areas, representative of those places to the wider world. And in Alabama, of course, that characteristic variation emerged as pork, smoked over an open pit of hickory wood or coals, and usually served with slices of white bread and a sauce that was tailored to the preferences of the restaurateur and his or her customers, uh, most commonly based in some combination of tomato and vinegar. Before any of you start screaming for me from the audience that there are others, I am aware. Um, I am aware. Very, this research has made me very aware. Uh, but it was also the case that some of the most iconic barbecue restaurants in the state became iconic in part because of their willingness to experiment with styles and preparations. And those styles and those preparations in turn also became things for which Alabama barbecue would be known. And arguably for nobody was that more true than for Bob Gibson. Uh, in the early 1920s, Gibson, who was a, uh, can't quite tell from this picture, but he was a sizable man, uh, popularly known as Big Bob Gibson. He was a railroad worker. Started selling barbecue on the weekend out of his backyard in Decatur. And that side business became so successful that he soon quit the railroad. He teamed up with his brother-in-law, a man named Sam Woodall. They opened a restaurant on Moulton Road called Gib Alls. It's a good thing they changed the name. It's hard to say. Sam Woodall soon left the partnership, but Gibson carried on the business under the name Big Bob Gibson Barbecue. The restaurant relocated a number of times in those early years, often in tiny little spots where Gibson's grandson remembered you might stand up and place an order and might have a few chairs or stools or something. And then in 1952, it finally settled on a permanent location on 6th Avenue, which is also Highway 31 in Decatur. But wherever it went and continued to grow, it pulled in more of Gibson's family members and became renowned, of course, for its white barbecue sauce. Uh, most of you, I'm sure, have experienced this. It's this sort of mayonnaise, vinegar, and pepper-based concoction that Gibson originally used for dunking his smoked chickens in. And at first, this started off as this kind of weird local variation. But white barbecue sauce eventually became a signifier of Alabama barbecue. Uh, you can find it now at restaurants all over the state. Um, I don't eat a lot of barbecue out of the state where I've seen it, but it would not shock me at all to see it in other places as well. Now, Bob Gibson himself passed away in 1972, but his relatives continue to run the restaurant to this day. And the path that Big Bob Gibson's barbecue followed, right, from starting off as a side business in a kind of makeshift shack, uh, that became over time a new career in a permanent restaurant. And that path has not been unusual for successful barbecue sellers throughout the state. That was how the famous Green Top Barbecue in Dora became what it is. Founded in 1951 by Kenneth Nowton Cook in a concrete block building on what was at the time a new highway on the route from Birmingham to Memphis. The Green Top was purchased by Leo and Susie Hedrick in 1973. And they too started, they bought this place in an effort to get away from manual wage labor. Leo Hedrick had spent years working in coal mines. Susie had a job in a pharmacy. They didn't like them. They didn't want to work for wages. They didn't like working for richer bosses. And they saw barbecue as an opportunity for something better. They took a chance, and they met with great success. Now, obviously, race and racism were never far from the story of Alabama barbecue in the 20th century, any more than it had, they had been in the 19th. Jim Crow segregation in public places was the law in the state. And black Alabamians lacked access to the growing number of barbecue restaurants. But they too used barbecue restaurants as means of achieving some measure 
of financial independence. And those restaurants, in a way, they became spaces where African Americans might escape racial oppression. They might socialize without white oversight. And some black families, like some white families, became very successful on the Alabama barbecue scene. Uh, and I like to use just a couple of examples from where I live in Tuscaloosa County to prove the point. You know this guy. In the city of Tuscaloosa, John Big Daddy Bishop worked in the 1950s as a cement finisher. He too did not like this job. And you see, the way he told the story, he kept having these dreams where he was running a cafe, waiting on customers. He had no training as a cook. But in 1958, he quit his job anyway. He opened a restaurant called Dreamland. That's why it's called Dreamland, because he kept having these dreams. And when Dreamland first opened, it served burgers, stuff off the grill, along with the barbecue. But Bishop remembered later all the other stuff I couldn't sell it. Wouldn't do nothing but throw it out. People wasn't buying nothing but the barbecue. So he scrapped the other menu items, started serving nothing but hickory smoked ribs and white bread. And slowly but surely, Dreamland built up a following. That following started crossing over the color line. The restaurant became especially popular with students from the University of Alabama. And from a, what started off as just a little shack built around a cinder block pit, Dreamland has since expanded to nine locations in Alabama and Georgia. But not every successful black-owned barbecue restaurant has felt the need to grow the way that Dreamland has. Just across the Black Warrior River from Tuscaloosa in Northport, George Archibald left his job at a steel mill, and his wife Betty quit hers at a paper mill to open Archibald's Barbecue in 1962. It is a little place. It's just there a couple weeks ago. Still a little place. Bigger than it used to be, but still little. And today it is run by the children of the founders. There's no website for it. The menu consists mostly of ribs or pulled pork, some white bread. You can get potato chips and some tea. But Bear Bryant loved the place. It's kept the family working for more than 50 years. And Archibald's ribs routinely appear on lists of the best barbecue in the state and really in the country. Now, these businesses, black-owned businesses, like Dreamland, like Archibald, these were founded in an age when racial hierarchy was the law. But as I suggested, they also managed to make their way through the era of segregation and to appeal to customers across the color line. And that reality demonstrates how foodways could be a path, a narrow path, but a path nonetheless toward an integrated world. But Alabama barbecue was instrumental not only in modeling an integrated world. Barbecue also helped make that world come into being in some very tangible ways. Because even though I've sort of dropped this theme for the last 15 minutes or so, barbecue and politics could never really be separated. So when the Civil Rights Act of 1964 passed, barred racial discrimination in public places, an organization known as the Birmingham Restaurant Association challenged the law's constitutionality. And they used a barbecue restaurant in Birmingham called Ollie's as a test case. Now, Ollie's had been founded in 1926 as a roadside stand on Green Springs Highway by James Ollie McClung. In 1927, it moved to a more permanent establishment. By 1964, it had become a Birmingham institution on 7th Avenue South. And it was sort of ironic that the Restaurant Association chose Ollie's as their test case. Now, it was true that Ollie's, despite being in a predominantly black neighborhood, uh, it operated the way a lot of white Jim Crow businesses did. Only served white customers in the restaurant, in the dining room. Black customers had to pick up their orders from a takeout counter. And it was true that unlike a lot of restaurants in Birmingham, Ollie's made it clear that it would refuse to comply with the federal law that banned segregation. But it was also true that two-thirds of the employees of Ollie's were black, and it was true that they often used their employee discount to buy food to feed civil rights workers. Jim Crow was weird, um, had these really strange sort of convolutions. And the Supreme Court, of course, by a unanimous decision, overruled Ollie's challenge to the Civil Rights Act. It upheld the constitutionality of the law, and it determined that the interstate commerce powers of the federal government gave Congress the clear authority to enforce the basic civil rights of every American 
regardless of race. The owners of Ollie's, meanwhile, had been concerned that integrating would drive away white customers, but they started serving an integrated dining room two hours after the court handed down its decision, and Ollie stayed in business after that for more than 35 years. It would be okay. Now, today, Alabama's barbecue scene, still a product of regional culture, still deeply Southern in its significance, but it reflects both the increasing popularity of the cuisine across the entire United States and some of the specific local traditions going back more than 200 years. There's probably no enterprise that speaks to the expansion of Alabama barbecue across the country more than the success of Jim and Nick's. Saw a truck outside, that might be which I'll eat, I'm not sure. Jim and Nick's was founded in Birmingham on the site of a former pizza place in 1985 by a father and son team, Jim and Nick Pahakis. And Jim and Nick's hired a former pit worker from Ollie's as their first employee. And over the course of the 30 years after that, it's grown to more than 30 locations in seven states, mostly in the South, but they have recently opened a few outlets in Colorado. And it will not surprise me if they open more outside the South as well. On the other hand, meanwhile, nothing speaks to the persistence of tradition and to the importance of local communities in Alabama barbecue more than the barbecue clubs of West Alabama's Sumter County. Now, these clubs really revive scenes of antebellum barbecues. And really, they were reminiscent of barbecues held in the late 19th century by organizations like the Montgomery Gun Club or the Alabama Bar Association. Sumter County, they, they had barbecues back then too. Sumter County's barbecue clubs grew out of these sort of white fraternal organizations that started gathering in the 20s to play cards, to gamble, share a meal. And today, barbecue clubs exist in seven different communities throughout Sumter County. Members of each club, of course, lay claim to the, their superiority of their cooking styles and their recipes. Most of them meet only for some of the year from the spring through the fall. And originally, they had fairly strict membership requirements. It was hard to get into these. But like Alabama barbecue more generally, they've gotten more inclusive and welcoming over time. And their purpose in many ways goes back to the very beginnings of barbecue in the state. They serve as occasions to bring people together in sparsely populated rural areas. They get together to contribute to the cohesion of their communities. They meet in schools, they meet in churches. One newspaper reporter writing about the clubs observed that what went on is what she called a sacramental supper that ties together neighbors and generations. Now in the 21st century, it's pretty clearly uh, through restaurants that most Alabamians experience barbecue. Traditional events like barbecue clubs, more recent innovations like barbecue competitions, those things make their mark on the scene. But every once in a while, the association between Alabama barbecue and politics, sometimes that comes back too. And not only when a potential candidate for office meets constituents at a country picnic. In 2006, John Big Daddy Bishop had been dead for nearly a decade by that point. But that year, his Dreamland restaurants developed a marketing campaign to have him posthumously elected governor of Alabama. Now, some of you may remember this. I actually don't even remember them doing this. I was here in 2006, but I don't remember that. The campaign obviously was tongue in cheek, but the slogans were right on point. Move Bishop from the smokehouse to the state house, campaigners argued. They reminded voters about the need to keep the pork in politics. Now, had they been able to see the future Alabama's political candidates in the age of Jackson, they would have loved that one. They might have even asked themselves why they didn't think of it first. Thank you. That was a microphone hitting the floor. I dropped the microphone, but if you would please raise your hands and we'll um, ask your questions. Thank you. Not really a question, but more of a comment. Thank you very much. Uh, you did a really good job. Your enunciation, the clarity of your speech, 
Uh, it's much appreciated for the older elements uh, here in the room. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Usually when people start off with that, they're about to tell me something I got wrong. So <laughs> I'm sure there's a few of you have got that. So. Uh, you mentioned uh, barbecue competitions mm -hmm. a little bit at the end. They don't seem to be nearly as popular in Alabama as they are over in Georgia and South Carolina. Yeah. Any reason for that, you think? I don't, I don't know. You know what? In, in doing the research for this, and yes, we ate a lot of barbecue while doing the research for this, um, we went to one of these. We went up to Coleman, and we went to one of these barbecue competitions. I don't know if they're even as popular as they were just a few years ago. Um, it seemed to me that, that sort of maybe between five and ten years ago, there was a real vogue for these things. They were everywhere. Um, and they're still pretty popular, I think. But I don't know why they would be less popular here than they would be in other places. Um, uh, you know, I don't know a huge amount about the competition scene. It wouldn't surprise me if they try to gather in places where they're going to be uh, sort of bigger populations. So bring people to Atlanta, or they'll go, uh, they'll go to Memphis, or they'll go, um, uh, you know, to... Uh, uh, I don't know, Florida probably not, but, um, you know, they might go to Charleston. Um, but I don't know the answer as to why they might be more popular in some places than others. Um, and the competition scene is a weird thing. Have you ever been to one of those? No, but my nephew was very big into them. I was. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a peculiar thing because the barbecue is quite good, obviously, but it, because it's being tailored to a certain set of judging standards, the cooks are trying to achieve a certain style that will appear to the judges. So even though the preparations are fantastic, um, in some ways it, it, I felt at least, and people who are really big in competitions would tell me I'm wrong, I'm sure, um, but I felt in some ways that it sort of flattens out some of the, some of the variety in barbecue because there's a certain sort of, you know, they, the, the competitions have standards about how exactly the meat is supposed to sit on the bone and what exactly the color is supposed to be like and all on and on and on in order to determine what's the best. But of course, we all know one of the things about Alabama, uh, about barbecue rather, is the fun about arguing about which is best. Right? That's half the fun. Um, your sauce is terrible, my sauce is good, mustard sauce is an abomination, white sauce, right? it goes on and on like that. Um, and the, the competition sort of, I don't know, it, it, it takes some element of that out. Um, and that's, I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing, but that was my own impression of it. Yeah, I seem to recall a couple or three decades ago, there was a story that the original founder of Dreamland, before it franchised out, unfortunately franchised out, uh, had through sheer oversight neglected to pay federal income taxes. And is, is it a fact? I believe that's true. And part of the, I don't know whether it was through sheer oversight or not. I have that, no that's that. the sad part of the story. The happy part of the story is, and my memory may play tricks on me, is that they negotiated a settlement in which he would prepare ribs for an institution <laughs> in Tuscaloosa. I don't know. If, I don't know they, if that's true. I do. I, they did settle that case, and the family still owns the restaurants. Um, I, I, it would not shock me at all. Yeah. If uh, if preparing barbecue was part of the settlement, the smoke got in the way of memory and oversight. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. The uh, the interesting part about that, I was in the military and came to the university in, in sixty one, sixty two, and of course they were really beginning started then. And as y'all, some of us around you know, that was when integration started at the university. But the way they found it out, these Coach Bryant and these newscasters coming in, started talking about it, and somebody with the revenue department said, I wonder what's going on, and I don't think the man had ever paid any taxes. So well, I guess they, Bear Bryant could make or break a business. Yeah, but the way they did it, they went over to uh, Alistair over at the meat place, Ziggler's, and figured out how much meat he bought and how much barbecue they would Oh, my God. Eat. And I, I can't verify the figures, but I think it was like over a million dollars a man. Well, owned. if it's enough years, well, yeah. yeah, successful barbecue place. But, uh, I didn't mean to get into that, though. We, I know a couple here that travel, I mean, that judge, mm -hmm. and it just amazes me. I'll see her at the post office. Where you been? I was in Memphis, and they really travel all over the southeast. Oh, yeah. It is. These barbecue things are big business. Oh, yeah. No, they're really, they're, they're big competitions, and the the people who are both the judges and the people who are preparing the food are deadly serious about it. 
Um, I mean, there are, look, there are, there's, it, what, what struck me when we went to the, the competition was that there's a wide variety of things people bring to this, right? Some people just do it almost as a hobby. Um, it's something that, you know, they start, again, they, something they started doing in their backyard. Uh, they thought it'd be fun to enter a competition. They do that. And then there are other people, it's like, it's their life. Um, you know, they'll go to these things all over the country. All they want to do is win. Um, and so it, they're interesting. I mean, I didn't, I didn't dislike the competition I went to. The food was great, and um, people were generally in pretty good spirits about it. It's sort of friendly competition. Some people are more friendly about it than others. And the other thing, sauce is a big thing now. Everybody's got mm -hmm. sauce. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, it's easier to... to um, sort of project your business beyond the locality with the sauce, right? Because the sauce you can put in a jar. Um, people bring Dreamline sauce all over the country. Uh, you can, you know, uh, uh, ship the ribs. Um, it's trickier. Um, it's more expensive. It's a little more complicated. There's a lot more risk of spoilage. Um, but the sauce is a way that you can become sort of known all over the place, regardless of whether people ever come to the restaurant. Uh, your thing about Tim Litchie Barbecue Club uh -huh. in Sumter County... I was born in Sumter County, and I think I attended my first uh, barbecue when I was probably maybe four years old. And my question to you is, have you ever had barbecue at one of the barbecue clubs in Sumter County? Mm -mm. And you should have it. I know. It, it, I know. Well, we were, you know, it it's funny you say that. absolutely the best barbecue you will ever eat in your life. So says everybody about the barbecue that they love. Uh, and I don't doubt it. Uh, you know, it's funny you, you, you ask that because when we were kind of finishing this up, and we did this project in conjunction with, partially with the, the State Tourism Department, partially with the Southern Foodways Alliance at, uh, at Ole Miss, um, and part of what we were supposed to do as a, a kind of epilogue to this is we were going to go out to Sumter County and we were going to make a, a, a sort of very short documentary film about the barbecue clubs, and we just, we could never get the negotiations quite right. Um, we couldn't get in in time for the fall season, and then when the spring season came around, it had sort of fallen off people's radars, and so it never quite meshed the way that I wanted it to. Um, but I would very much like to go out to one of the barbecue clubs sometimes. So it's, you know, I, I'm, I don't doubt that the food is fantastic, but it just seems so, um, it, it, it really is, it's a throwback in a lot of ways to a, a uh, to a culture that is not nearly as prevalent now as it used to be. Um, and it is, it's remarkable to see people still bringing their community together in that way. And I would, that's something I would, I've been to suppers like that, but never to one of these. I would love to see it. Question right here. Mm -hmm. um, also, Sumter County. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> My mother was reared in Sumter County. My uncle's 95, and he lives just south of Aliceville. But... He belongs to Panola mm -hmm. uh, United Methodist Church, and they have had a continuous barbecue for 80-something yeah. years. It's the last Thursday in July. I mean, in June. I'm sorry. They just do it, once. Once a year. Okay. Once a year now. The uh, members have gotten elderly. They did have it once a month for like May through yeah, August most of them or September, sort of right? right? But it's one time a year, the last uh, Thursday in June. If you'd like to come, I'll see you there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. <laughs> we have any more questions? Don't be shy. Raise your hands. All right, well, thank you for coming, and let's give a round of applause to our speakers. Thank you.